Hello and welcome, I'm Sonic Guru, and welcome to the premiere episode of Blue Blur Season 2. To kick off this season, we're going to take a look at one of the most requested topics of the Sonic lore. Who are Silver's parents? Silver the Hedgehog was first introduced in Sonic the Hedgehog 2006. It was originally planned to be an orange mink named Venice, but later changed to a silver coloured hedgehog to sit alongside Sonic and Shadow. Silver's purpose was to showcase the physics of the Havoc engine with his psychic powers. Silver lives 200 years or so in the future, where his role is to protect his time by changing the catastrophes of the past, thus preventing the ruining of his era. This was first seen in Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 as he tried to stop the fire demon Iblis after Mephiles shows him that Sonic is the one who caused the end of the world as he knows it. In Sonic Rivals and Sonic Rivals 2, his mission was to stop Dr. Eggbang Nega, another character with an alternating backstory, from destroying the past by using a special card making camera or making the chow extinct and then return to the future. He is best described as having a strong sense of justice, and it is this personality trait that motivates him to head back to the past to correct the future. He also makes alliances and rivalries very easily and takes people's word without question. This makes him very easily tricked by others as shown in Sonic 2006. And finally, he is one of the few characters that have a super state. In the Archie comics before the reboot, his personality and mission to save the future remains the same, but we also see the consequences of his actions as his mentor's memories alter with every trip he takes to find the traitor of the Freedom Fighters. He has fought alongside him in the present, future, and an alternate timeline before becoming a member of the secret Freedom Fighters. Some fans have speculated that Silver could possibly be the descendant of Shadow, Sonic, Amy, or another character, but this has not been confirmed. A lot of fans point towards Sonic and the Black Knight to support this theory where Silver is depicted as Sir Galahad, the son of Sir Lancelot who was played by Shadow, indicating a possible hint at Silver's heritage. But seeing how this was in the Arthurian legends, it can easily be dismissed as Lamarck was Percival's brother and Gawain and Arthur were uncle and nephew. In every fan scenario, Shadow has always been Silver's father, whereas the majority, Amy has been the mother. This is all based on looks, personality and skills as Shadow is quite experienced in Chaos Energy and Amy was skilled in tarot cards displaying a minute form of psychic ability. What also draws these characters together is the comparisons made between Sonic and Dragon Ball Z, with Silver and Trunks being time travellers and Shadow and Vegeta as anti-heroes. Where this could be possible, there is a huge plot hole concerning the timeline. As I've stated before, Silver is from 200 years or so in the future and not 15 to 20 years where it might be plausible. That is not to say that it could not be related to the heroes of today. Although Sega may not intend to reveal who Silver's parents really are, there has been no evidence from them that destabilizes the idea of Shadow as Silver's father. Although this is one question that will most likely never be answered, fan fiction and fan art about this will continue giving us all sorts of possible outcomes. Welcome to another episode of Blue Blur. You voted, and new to this season is a random collection of Sonic facts, so let's get started. The western release of Popful Mail was going to be a Sonic themed game called Sister Sonic, and the entire cast would have featured the Sonic characters along with Sonic's sister. Due to a large number of angry responses from its 1993 announcement, Sega released Popful Mail as an English port with no changes. Vector the Crocodile was part of the conceptual design for Sonic the Hedgehog on the Sega Mega Drive. He would appear playing the keyboard alongside other characters in a band during the game's sound test where Sonic would breakdance to the music. Unfortunately, this was scrapped along with Sonic's human girlfriend, Madonna. Vector would later show up in Knuckles Chaotix as a playable character and reappear later in Sonic Heroes alongside Espio the Chameleon and Charmy B. Despite having an official birth date, June 23rd, and a few non-canonical birth dates such as Christmas and Boxing Day, Sonic has never aged. He has remained 15 years old, even in Sonic Generations where he had a birthday party. Sonic's first appearance was not in his own game. 
In fact, he first appeared in Rad Mobile, a racing game by Sega, as an air freshener a few months before the release of Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> Dr. Eggman is not the only character with an international identity crisis. Knack the Weasel was originally called Fang the Sniper, and instead of a pop gun, the character was to wield a silver magnum. Sega deemed this far too serious for younger audiences and changed his weapon in all versions along with his name in Western releases. Later, certain promotional materials would display Knack's name as Knack the Weasel, aka Fang the Sniper. This allowed Sega to refer to him as Fang in games from that point on. The prototype for Sonic Rush was a short, single-level game called Sonic DS. The player would swipe the touchscreen left and right as fast as they could while Sonic ran a predetermined course. Nintendo Official Magazine criticized the game for being too simple while praising the graphics. Soon after, the demo was discarded and Sega began work on Sonic Rush. In Sonic the Hedgehog 2006, Shadow is seen removing his inhibitor rings which increases Shadow's overall power output but at the risk of overexerting himself. This was an idea carried over from Sonic X and is seen in the Shadow Saga finale. This is most likely what Sonic handed to Rouge in Sonic Adventure 2. Only three of the six Sonic animations have been officially produced by Sega. These are the OVA Sonic the Hedgehog movie, Sonic X and Sonic Boom. Sonic Unleashed was originally conceptualized as the third Sonic Adventure title with the working title of Sonic World Adventure. However, the development team began to introduce enough new innovations to separate it from the adventure titles, so they decided to rename it Sonic Unleashed overseas, whereas in Japan, it would remain as Sonic World Adventure. There is an anime featuring anthropomorphic goddesses of Sega's consoles called Sega Heart Girls. The series follows three such girls, Dreamcast, Sega Saturn, and Mega Drive, who must graduate from Sehagagar Academy, a special school located in Haneda, Tokyo, by venturing into the worlds of various Sega games and earning medals. One of these games was Sonic the Hedgehog, who must graduate from the Sega... Ha what the fuck does that say? Daniel! Hi, I'm Sonic Guru, and welcome to another episode of Blue Blur. This time we're taking a look at another part of the Sonic lore that has more than one variation. Who are Sonic's parents? I long for my children, but I have to wait. To act too soon could seal their fate. Throughout Sonic's 24 year history, not once has Sonic's parents been referenced or mentioned in games, but rather in comics and animation. Not just one set, but three different mothers and two fathers. Sonic's first parents were shown in a 1992 Shokakugan manga strip written by Kenji Tarada and illustrated by Sango Norimoto. The series followed the adventures of Nikki, a young hedgehog who through some manner was able to transform into Sonic the Hedgehog. Nikki lives in a world similar to modern day Japan with his parents, Polly and Brenda, as well as a little sister, Anita. His friends were a pudgy hedgehog named Little John and Amy, who was also Nikki's girlfriend. The strip also featured Tails, who knew of Nikki's alter ego, and an early version of Charmy B. Unfortunately, not much about this series is known as copies of the original strips were not collected and are extremely rare. Years later, we were introduced to Sonic's parents, Jules and Bernadette, or Bernie for short, in the pre Super Genesis wave of the Archie Sonic the Hedgehog comics. Both Bernie and Jules were agents of King Aikon's special forces during the Great War. Following the takeover of Dr. Ivor Robotnik, Bernie and Jules were subsequently roboticized and became mindless servants. Years later, when their free will was restored, Bernie was de-roboticized whereas Jules remained a Robian due to the injuries he sustained during the Great War. Despite this, he and Bernie continued to be the father and mother Sonic lacked for many years, even coming to his defense in several situations. And finally, in Sonic Underground, we were introduced to Queen Alina, the mother of Sonic and his siblings Manic and Zonia. Queen Alina was the former ruler of Mobius before she was deposed at the hands of Dr. Robotnik. She was forced to abandon her children and leave them with three separate families in order to protect them. Years later, the Oracle who warned Alina of this deadly fate helps reunite the triplets so they can work together in search of their mother. Throughout the series, Alina helps Sonic, Manic and Zonia along the way by leaving cryptic messages and clues for them to find, and several times intervene directly to save her children. According to prophecy, the Queen and her children will one day reunite and form the Council of Four, bringing about Robotnik's defeat. 
due to the cancellation of the series, this never occurred in an episode, but it's highly likely that if it wasn't cancelled, the prophecy would have come true. This may surprise you, but there is no theory to this. At all. Any theory I structured could have easily been broken down by all manner of things such as the comics and cartoons being non-canon, or the question being addressed to Sonic's friends. I had many such as Sonic and his friends being orphans either because of Eggman roboticizing their parents, or them being able to care for him at a young age. Personally I played around the idea that Queen Alina was his mother along with Zomia, but an attempted coup for the throne forced her to give them up and entrust them to her handmaiden and longtime friend Bernie to take them out of the kingdom and raise them both as her own. If you're wondering why Manic wasn't mentioned, it's because I don't really like him. Bottom line, this is one of those theories where fan fiction and fan comics hit the shine and correct chapters of Sonic's early life before he became the hero of today. Hello and welcome, I'm Sonic Guru, and welcome to another episode of Blue Blur. This time we're changing zones and taking a look at the beta for Sonic the Hedgehog CD. Sonic the Hedgehog CD was released in September 1993 for the Sega Mega CD in Japan, October for Europe, and November for the Sega CD in the United States. It was directed by Naruto Oshima and was developed separately in Japan, unlike Sonic the Hedgehog's direct sequels, which were created in the United States with the Sega Technical Institute. The game is most famously known for the introduction of Amy Rose and Metal Sonic. In preparation for the launch of their new console add-on, the Mega CD, Sega Japan wanted some sort of Sonic title on the console, hoping its premier franchise would cause a new technology to be a success. At first, the company considered simply to develop an enhanced version of either Sonic 1 or the upcoming Sonic the Hedgehog 2 as a practice for the system add-on. For some reason, however, it was decided that instead of porting an existing title, a new entry in the Sonic series would be developed from the ground up, which could take full advantage of the capabilities of the Mega CD. When it was announced, many gaming magazines at the time reported that the upcoming CD-based Sonic game would be a port of Sonic 2. This was not the case. As Oshima would recount, Sonic CD wasn't Sonic 2. It was really meant to be more of a CD version of the original Sonic. I can't help but wonder, therefore, if we had more fun making CD than they did making Sonic 2, because we didn't have the pressure of making a numbered sequel. Oshima contacted Yuji Naka and other members of the Sega Technical Institute during the initial planning stages, where both teams exchanged information about what the other wanted to do. It was during these early moments that Sonic CD started to take shape. Although the Sonic 2 team briefly considered the idea of time travel as a play mechanic, Oshima fully embraced the concept, likening the idea of the world around Sonic changing, similar to the instantaneous time travel movement from Back to the Future. Unfortunately, limited programming restricted this to a loading screen. Sonic CD had a lengthy development with many changes and alterations made. Thanks to a group of fans, four beta prototypes have found their way online. The earliest of which is Build 510 from May 1992. The differences start before the title screen with a 3D Sega logo while the Sega sound plays. The title screen is very different with the Sega logo attached to the ring and gold and with the working title CD Sonic the Hedgehog displayed on the ribbon. Also appearing as a credit for Keiko Yutoko, the singer of the Japanese and European opening theme You Can Do Anything. Letting the game play a demo of the special stage displays the message The Programmer Has a Nap, Hold Out Programmer. During gameplay, Sonic spots a different appearance on the goalpost and Amy has larger eyes and quills. The prototype featured three additional power-ups. The S monitor, which increases Sonic's speed and has an invincibility shield. The blue ring monitor, which functions identical to the S monitor. And the clock monitor. It does not work correctly, but it's assumed that the role is to freeze time for a few seconds. Finally, the Zone 1 boss is slightly different with pincers instead of bounce shields. As completing all three acts, coming soon is displayed. A level select code can be entered to play the rest of the levels, each having minor differences in the final game. Though the soundtrack remains mostly identical to the final game, with the exception of the past music tracks as they have yet to be implemented, there are some differences. The title screen or time attack music is almost completely different in the prototype, with no resemblance to the song You Can Do Anything. The 
Speed Shoes has a different remix of the theme song. And finally, the sound clip for Traveling Through Time was changed drastically. The second beta is 712. The title screen is closer to the final version, with many elements from 510 remaining within the game, but with subtle differences, such as the blue ring monitor acting as a shield with extra hits. The special stage demo that plays while waiting at title screen is playable, but not fully finished as the oil slick is present but doesn't affect Sonic in play. Beta 806 is a near final build. This was released in stores as a demo CD in Japan. Unlike other prototypes, the disc comes complete with cover art. The demo has a limited amount of levels playable, but this can be circumvented with a level select code. The final beta, 920, was found to be the final US version of the game, but with the original soundtrack that was used in the Japanese and European versions of the game. When it came to localizing the game for America, almost the entire soundtrack was redone by Spencer Nielsen. Because the Sega of America thought the soundtrack for the Japanese and European versions sounded too identical to the electronic dance soundtracks being produced at the time, so the American soundtrack has a more rock feel. One example of this is the theme song. Instead of You Can Do Anything, the American version has Sonic Boom. The only songs that weren't altered were the past themes and some being repurposed, such as the theme for Little Planet being used for the Time Attack menu. In 1996, Sonic CD was ported to the PC. Among the most noteworthy changes of this version was that a longer version of the FMV animated intro sequence is available. There is also a number of differences between the Mega CD and PC port, such as a faster special stage and loading screens showing Little Planet from DA Garden. This port was later used in the compilation disc Sonic Gems Collection, with some enhancements and missing effects, such as having transparent water in Tidal Tempest. In 2011, Sonic CD was remastered by Christian Whitehead, also known as the Taxman on Sonic Retro, and was built from scratch using this proprietary retro engine and was released digitally on multiple platforms including PSN and Xbox Live. This version has many new features such as sharper graphics, both US and Japanese soundtracks, a choice between the original CD or Sonic 2 style Spin Dash, and Tails as a playable character. There are also other changes such as new sound effects and smooth animations. This remastered port also has its own piece of beta information. Entering the code PCM32DA8 on the sound test briefly shows a mock-up image of Desert Dazzle, a stage that was once planned for the remake. Taxman unveils someone used Bandicam and Robotnik sprites for a zone called R2. R2 is a missing level from the original Sonic CD and is believed to be set after Palm Tree Panic as it is coded R1 and Collision Chaos is R3. A brief clip in the extended animation shows what the zone could have looked like. The Desert Dazzle was set to replace R2, but was cut so the game didn't stray too far from its original form. Though it had a vastly different development compared to Sonic's numbered sequels, both the Mega CD and its 2011 re-release went on to receive critical acclaim as one of the best games of the platform and is regarded as one of the best 2D Sonic titles of all time. Hello and welcome. I'm James Sullivan, aka YouTube user HiMateDude, and welcome to another episode of Blue Blur. This time we're going to answer the question which many have asked, is Shadow the Hedgehog real or an android? Shadow the Hedgehog was first introduced in Sonic Adventure 2 for the Sega Dreamcast. Shadow was created 50 years ago in the space colony Ark as the ultimate life form by Gerald Robotnik. His purpose was to provide ways to help develop cures for incurable, deadly diseases, more specifically for Gerald's granddaughter, Maria Robotnik, who was suffering from NIDS. But the military boarded and raided the colony, killing or arresting all the scientists involved with the project, including Gerald and Maria, when Shadow was deemed as a threat to humanity. They captured Shadow and put him into stasis. Fifty years later, Shadow was released by Dr. Eggman to help him conquer the world. Initially, Shadow sought to destroy Earth to avenge Maria, who had been killed by the military, but was persuaded to help save it from Gerald's doomsday plans. 
In the process, Supersonic and Super Shadow stopped the colony from crashing into the planet below, the latter of whom fell and was presumed dead. Later in Sonic Heroes, Shadow was found by Rouge in one of Eggman's hidden bases. With one of Eggman's rebellious robots, E-123 Omega, they formed Team Dark to track down Eggman to get some answers and revenge. It was later revealed that Eggman had made robotic android versions of Shadow, and the question was raised as to whether or not Shadow himself is one of these androids. Shadow also bore brief witness to a broken Shadow android earlier. Ultimately, when Metal Sonic transformed into Metal Overlord, Shadow worked with everyone else to help defeat him. Shadow was last seen with E-123 Omega holding the defeated Metal Sonic. In the game Shadow the Hedgehog, with his memories lost, he sought to uncover his past, during which he met Black Doom, who knew who Shadow was and told him to bring him the Chaos Emeralds as promised before disappearing. Fueled with desire to seek out his past and find out the truth behind Black Doom's words, Shadow sped off to obtain the Emeralds. After successfully gathering all of the Emeralds, Shadow was confronted by Black Doom, who commanded him to give up the Emerald so that they can begin the Ritual of Prosperity. Sonic and the others, including Eggman, then arrived and told Shadow not to listen to him. It was revealed that Black Doom wished to harvest humans as an energy source. He took the Chaos Emeralds from Shadow and used Chaos Control to warp the Black Comet down to the surface of the planet. Black Doom then explained that he helped Professor Gerald create Shadow, but only in return for the Chaos Emeralds, which were needed to bring the comet down to the surface, before he paralyzed everyone with a special gas and left them to be devoured by his alien offspring. Shadow suddenly heard Maria asking for help, and he broke through the paralysis and chased after Black Doom. Ultimately, Shadow thwarted Black Doom in his super form and used the Eclipse Cannon for its original intention to destroy the Black Comet. From there, Shadow continued his mission to protect humanity by becoming a special agent of Gun alongside Rouge and Omega as Team Dark, and continues to be a direct rival to Sonic the Hedgehog. Though those games were some of the heavier chapters of the history of Shadow the Hedgehog, there is a plot hole between the ending of Sonic Adventure 2 and the beginning of Team Dark's story in Sonic Heroes. And with the latter game's ending, there's the question. Is the Shadow we know from Heroes to the present the same Shadow from Sonic Adventure 2? Fortunately, the answer has been under our noses the whole time. During the final boss fight against Devil Doom, Eggman revealed the truth as to what happened at the end of Sonic Adventure 2. Can you hear me? This might be the last chance I have to speak to you, so what I said about having created you, it was all a lie. Everyone died during that horrible incident, but I rescued you with one of my robots. You lost your memory, that's all. You really are the ultimate life form my grandfather created. Some say Eggman was lying in order for Shadow to feel certain of who he was, and to defeat Doom, as he is known to lie, but only when it benefited him in the end and not the world enslaved or destroyed by an alien race. This has been less of a theory and more of a fact that many have overlooked, but due to the confusing narrative of Shadow's history, that's understandable. Either way, Shadow will forever be the mysterious Dark Hedgehog. Hello and welcome to another episode of Blue Blur. I am the Sega Scourge, the Sonic Theorist, and it's time to kick off another Top 10 Sonic Facts. Let's get this started. Number 1. When Sega first made Sonic, they were under the impression that hedgehogs couldn't swim, so they made it a point that part of Sonic's gameplay mechanics would be that he sinks instead of swims, collecting bubbles for air and drowning if remaining underwater for too long. This, unfortunately, was a mistake on Nakasan's part. Hedgehogs can actually swim, and even float on their backs. Number 2. A number of pop culture icons were gathered as resources for Sonic's initial concept and creation. Naoto Ashima borrowed Felix the Cat's head and Mickey Mouse's body for Sonic's basic likeness. Michael Jackson's boots from the Bad album inspired Sonic's patented footwear with a Santa Claus-inspired color scheme. Number 3. 
in Sonic CD, if you wait three minutes without touching the controller, Sonic will ditch the player, jumping off the screen, causing a game over. Number 4 Breakdancing has been described as one of Sonic's favorite pastimes, mostly in the Sonic the Hedgehog comics. However, Sonic has shown his love for breakdancing in the games as well. In Super Smash Bros. Brawl, one of his taunts is a breakdance, and several 3D Sonic games nowadays show Sonic breakdancing on level clear screens as well. Number 5 Silver the Hedgehog was originally conceptualized as an orange mink named Venice after the Italian city of the same name, which in turn inspired the city of Soliana. His inclusion in Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 was mainly to show off the game's new physics engine. By including a character that can pick up objects and toss them around at will using his psychic abilities. Number 6 the Water God of Destruction, Chaos, from Sonic Adventure was represented differently in the UK's Sonic the Comic. In this continuity, Chaos was a prosecutor of the Dracon Empire, who mutated into the creature when he was exposed to Chaos Energy during the time of the Echidnas. This was witnessed by Sonic, who was brought back in time by Tikal's magic and revealed to the Echidna race that the Dracons were actually a race of alien fish inside of robotic exoskeletons. In the present, Dr. Robotnik was able to imprison Chaos some time before being overthrown and his empire left in ruins by Sonic and the gang, which in turn led to Chaos's escape. STC Chaos's powers include inducing intense fear to those who get too close to him and being near invulnerable. His perfect form is also vastly different from the games, being instead an octopus-like being, able to warp reality itself. Chaos was eventually reduced back to his original Dracon fish form, however, after Super Sonic absorbed all of his Chaos energy. Number 7 Sonic Adventure 2 is notorious for its bad audio and lip-syncing issues. This is due to the cutscenes being synced to the Japanese dub and not the English dub, which causes characters to talk over one another. This is odd, however, as Sonic Adventure 2 was developed in the United States and not Japan, where this issue is most common. Number 8 In Sonic Rush, if you tap the character during gameplay on the touchscreen, the character will react to your prodding. Sonic will turn to the player and stretch, while Blaze will leap off the ground like a scared cat. This also happens in both Sonic Rush Adventure and Sonic Colors DS. Number 9 The sound quality of the WiiWare release of Sonic the Hedgehog 4 Episode 1 sounds substantially different compared to other platforms. This is because the WiiWare service has a size limit of 40 megabytes, so much of the game's sound had to be compressed to fit. This is also why Episode 2 sadly never saw a release on the Wii platform. And finally, number 10. After the end credits of Sonic Generations, the cry, Happy Birthday, Sonic! was a combined recording from the attendees of both Summer of Sonic and Sonic Boom conventions in 2011 before the game's release that same year. The first of which, SOS 11, I was actually present for and was lucky enough to be a part of that recording. Hi. I'm Sonic Guru, and welcome to another episode of Blue Blur. This time we're looking back on a previous theory and delving deeper into time travel, dimensions and multiple timelines. Sonic the Hedgehog, also known as Sonic 2006 because of the year it was released, and not to be confused with the first game of the same name, needs little to no introduction. It is considered one of the worst games in Sonic's 25 year long history. But for those not caught up, Sonic 06 was to be the next installment of the franchise for Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, celebrating Sonic's 15th anniversary. Taking advantage of the next-gen hardware and the Havoc physics engine, Sega intended for Sonic the Hedgehog to be a soft reboot to the series, citing, What if Sonic existed in the real world? What followed was nothing short of a mess. 
preceded by a series of unfortunate events from Yuji Naka resigning as the head of Sonic Team and executive producer to the development team being split into two to work on Sonic and the Secret Rings for Nintendo Wii. What was once an ambitious title was now a race against time to finish before deadline. In this time, Sonic Team reportedly ignored quality assurance bug reports just to have the game ready for Christmas 2006, regardless of the consequences. These consequences were the overwhelming negative reception and the destabilization of a once dedicated fanbase. Complaints include long frequent load times, a poorly written story, bad voice direction and dialogue, bugs and glitches being riddled throughout the game, and a camera that worked against the player. The only silver lining fans took away from this game was its ending. Throughout the game's narrative, Methylis is trying to reunite with Iblis, which was sealed within Princess Elise by her father after a botched experiment to control the time powers of Solaris, which resulted in it being split in two. Sonic, Shadow and Silver are sent travelling across the city of Soliana and through time between present and future, with the latter two hedgehogs going to the past trying to stop both deities as well as saving the princess from Eggman's scheme to control time itself. Unfortunately, Methodist gained the upper hand and killed Sonic, thus releasing the flames of Iblis and rejoining to form Solaris, a super-dimensional life form and a god of time. After reforming Solaris and being defeated by Sonic, Shadow and Silver in their super forms with Chaos Control, Elise and Sonic travel to a point in the past where they find the Flames of Disaster, Solaris' original form. Elise realises that if she puts out the Flames, Solaris will never exist, but she and Sonic will never have met. After much hesitation and despair about them not ever meeting, Sonic convinces Elise to put out the Flame, thus eliminating Solaris from existence once and for all. Time reboots back to the Festival of the Sun, only Eggman does not attack this time round. In effect, none of the game's events ever actually happened. Until Sonic Generations, where Sonic travels through Crisis City, fights Silver, and Blaze making mention of seeing that world again. I made mention before the possibility of Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 either being a sequel or a prequel to Sonic Rush, specifically with Blazer Cat appearing in both games with a different origin. But with the inclusion of Crisis City in Sonic Generations, what if Sonic is indeed a sequel that formed at the end of Sonic 06? To see how this could be possible, we have to understand how and what happened. As we all know, both games involve time travel to key points in time, but also a form of time compression. This is why we see many points of time in one area, such as the White Void and the Time Rift in Soliana. How time travel was achieved worked differently. The Time Meter was able to amass a void of time in a small space by travelling between them and tearing the fabric of reality, hence the White Void. Methylis, on the other hand, being the intelligence of Solaris, was able to create portals at will as Ken Eggman, who created a time machine based on the failed Solaris project. The final way that was shown is that two users have to induce chaos control in the same space, causing a tear in space and time. Though this does bring up the question as to how they know where and when they are travelling to. One can assume that they concentrate on a specific time and place like in Sonic's IAM, though that does not excuse Shadow and Silver's time portal. As I've mentioned before, after Solaris' defeat at the hands of the three Super Hedgehogs, Solaris was erased from time by Elise, thus restarting the events from that point onwards. But this would conclude that the future where Silver originates from no longer exists, right? Well, no. As seen in Dragon Ball Z, Trunks' future still exists, as does Silver's. Travelling to the past and changing the events does indeed create a new timeline of events leading up to the present. But this does not create a paradox as one would easily assume, but a new universe. With Silver and Trunks travelling back to the future, or present in their case, they are crossing over into another universe. Parallel universes and a the multiverse theory have been researched and it is said that for each choice we make a new universe is created. From travelling to the past and changing destiny, Silver and Trunks have disconnected themselves from time and no longer at risk from causality. With this in mind, it is easy to deduce that the future we see in Sonic 06 and Generations is in fact a separate timeline, split from the point of Solaris' flame being put out. But what about Blaze the Cat? As I have stated before in a previous episode, Blaze had been sent into another dimension at the end of Silver's story by absorbing and sealing Iblis within her. With Solaris being a dimensional deity with powers over time, it can be assumed that time restarted in the Soul dimension as well and gave Blaze a new beginning. 
It is said, however, that Sonic, Shadow, and Silver are the only ones who vaguely remember the Solaris event, but with a brief merging of timelines and Blaze recognizing Crisis City, it can be said that she remembers too, but again, vaguely, as all four characters have traveled through time, Silver more than others. The only argument to be made against this is Silver's story in Sonic Rivals and Rivals 2, where he comes from a future destroyed by a dimensional being named Ifrit, not Iblis, released by Eggman Neger. There is also the fact that in Sonic Colors DS, Silver states the future he comes from is good and not wrecked by a fierce deity. In conclusion, the possibility of multiple timelines may not have been Sega's original intention, but comparisons to Dragon Ball Z are apparent and Sega has made them public. But the idea of there being a cohesive timeline is far-fetched, as many events seem to take place next to or overlap each other. Whether you want to believe that the events of Sonic the Hedgehog 2006 are erased or made into a separate timeline is up to you, but we can all agree, it was a bad game. Hello and happy Halloween! I'm Sonic Guru and welcome to another episode of Blue Blur. This time we're taking another dive into the world of creepypastas and the infamous tale of Sonic.exe. Sonic.exe is a story about a teenager who encounters a series of paranormal events while playing a modified PC port of the original Sonic the Hedgehog. On August 9th, 2011, author JC De Hyena submitted a creepypasta story based on the edited image of the original game to the creepypasta wiki. The story itself concerns of a teen named Tom, who receives a bizarre CD in the mail from his friend Kyle, who he hasn't heard from in a while. Disregarding Kyle's note telling him to destroy the CD, Tom plays it and is disturbed by the title screen showing Sonic with bleeding black eyes with red pupils. As he plays the game further, Tom bears witness to just how monstrous this incarnation of the Blue Hedgehog really is. He captures, tortures and kills Tails, Knuckles and finally Eggman. Tom is left scared and confused as to what happened before hearing a literal blue demon behind him and sees a bloody-eyed Sonic doll on his bed. The story, as well as the character Sonic.exe, has been criticised for being badly written, cliché with horror tropes and using terms such as hyper-realistic to describe an in-game image. The creepypasta was removed from the wiki and moved to the Trollpasta wiki where it still remains. On August 13th, 2012, Game Jolt user Mystic Crimson released a game titled Sonic.exe based on the creepypasta story recounting the events of the game. Later, on January 9th, 2014, he released a fan-made sequel titled Sally.exe. The infamy of Sonic.exe has remained quite strong in the fanbase, resulting in many fanfictions, fan art and videos, expanding on the lore. But the main questions that are always asked is where does Sonic.exe come from and who or what is he? Though many have wrote about Sonic.exe's origin, there are different perspectives theorising where this demonic form of Sonic came from. First is about the in-game lore where Sonic submitted to the darkness within him and absorbed the negative chaos energy. This forced his body to change in a new way. Physically, he remained the same aside from his eyes that now reflected his murderous intent, but his powers now exceeded that of Dark Sonic or even Fleetway's depiction of Super Sonic, which itself is ruthless and violent. Think of it as a reverse Werehog transformation, where Dark Guy's monstrous change was physical but Sonic's heart remained strong. Others are speculated that Sonic came into contact with a hidden 8th Chaos Emerald, black in colour and bask in a dark aura. The other theory is set in our world, or rather, Tom and Kyle's. Sonic.exe was originally a demon in a realm called the Cursed World. Seeking a way to bring souls into his realm to rule over as a god, he uses demonic influence to control those with evil in their hearts. Learning about the popularity of Sonic the Hedgehog, he forced one to develop a Sonic ROM hack dubbed Sonic.exe. The game itself, when played, usually shows the inside of the demon's dimension and manipulates what goes on inside the game to show what it's capable of. When the game is installed onto the computer, the demon has full control of the hard drive and everything on it. And eventually, when the time is right, he'll come out of the game itself to grab his victims and pull them into his world when he can turn them into his slaves. 
using them as puppets in his game to torture and kill in order to spread his influence to one day escape from the cursed void and rule over our world. Additionally, there is a minor theory about how the Tales doll is a byproduct of Sonic.exe, which he uses to capture or kill many more unfortunate souls. Overall, the Sonic.exe creepypasta may be popular with some Sonic fans, but I'm in a majority who don't find the story scary, or in the least the original. It is nothing more than a direct ripoff of the Ben Drowned ARG based on a haunted copy of Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Furthermore, the idea that a game can affect the real world the real world the real world Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Are you enjoying my video? Yes. My video. The one you know a Sonic Guru has no recollection of ever making this. He was foolish enough to release me. He is mine now. Don't worry. He's not dead yet. He may be quite useful for me for now. But know that I can always change my mind. Share this video. Spread my influence. Or suffer the same fate as him as one of my many slaves. <laughs>